in the last lecture I introduced a refrigerant compressor then I explained uh, an ideal reciprocating compressor without clearance and with clearance. In this uh, lecture I shall explain the uh, effect of operating temperatures on the performance of an ideal reciprocating compressor with clearance. Then I shall explain the differences between an actual compressor and an ideal compressor. So the specific objectives of this particular lesson are to study the effects of evaporator and condenser temperatures on the performance of an ideal compressor with clearance and then to discuss the performance aspects of actual reciprocating compressors. And at the end of this lesson you should be able to explain the effects of evaporator and condenser temperatures on compressor performance and practical issues and list the differences between an ideal and actual compressor and explain the procedure for evaluating the performance of actual compressors. So let us look at uh, the performance aspects of an ideal compressor with clearance. Uh, first let us look at the effect of evaporator temperature. The effect of evaporator temperature is obtained by keeping the condenser temperature or pressure constant and also keeping the compressor displacement and clearance ratio fixed. That means we are uh, uh, finding out the effects by keeping these parameters as fixed. And to simplify the discussions it is further assumed that the refrigeration cycle is a uh, saturated sta single stage saturated standard cycle. First let us look at the effect of evaporator temperature on volumetric efficiency and refrigerant mass flow rate. As we have seen in the last class the volumetric efficiency uh, is given by this expression uh, clearance volumetric efficiency is equal to 1 plus epsilon minus epsilon into Pc by Pe to the power of 1 by n and as I have explained we are finding the performance by keeping this parameter fixed that means the clearance uh, ratio fixed and we are also keeping the uh, condenser temperature or pressure fixed and then we are varying the evaporator temperature. Varying the evaporator temperature is equivalent to varying the evaporator pressure. So if, uh, from this expression you can see that as you are increasing the evaporator pressure that means as you increase P uh, the pressure ratio. Or uh, reduces. Uh, once the pressure ratio adu reduces, the volumetric efficiency increases. So this is very clear from this figure, uh, uh, from this equation. This uh, uh, the same thing can also be seen from this figure. Okay, so it is very clear from this figure. What we have here is a um, uh, PV diagram of a compressor with clearance, and uh, here we are varying the evaporative pr pressures. Okay. As I said uh, varying the evaporator pressure is equivalent to varying the evaporator temperature. For example, look at this evaporator pressure. At an evaporator pressure for example at P3, uh, this is the actual volume uh, compressed and uh, this is the uh, displacement of the compressor. That means for this uh, pressure the volumetric efficiency as for given from this equation is simply equal to V A minus V 4 dash divided by V A minus V C. So now as you increase this evaporator pressure from P E 3 to P E 2, you see that the volume of refrigerant compressed has increased uh, from V 1 double dash uh, that is V A minus V 4 double dash to V A minus V4 dash okay and as a result uh, this will become V4 dash okay so the volumetric efficiency has increased and further increase in uh, evaporator pressure has uh, increased the volumetric efficiency further because the volume of the uh, refrigerant compressed has increased and from this you can see that for example when you are reducing the evaporator pressure further let us say that you are reducing the evaporator pressure further a point will come at which this line will simply meet the uh, uh, point V A okay that means the amount of uh, refrigerant compressed will be 0 that means this is the limiting uh, evaporator uh, pressure at which the volumetric efficiency becomes 0 that means it will be simply uh, re-expanding and compressing along the same line okay. The same thing is explained here also you can see that uh, here uh, we are varying the evaporator temperature or pressure 
and we are seeing the effect of this on clearance volumetric efficiency. So, you can see that the clearance volumetric efficiency increases rapidly as the evaporated temperature increases. Now, what is the effect of this evaporated temperature on mass flow rate? Uh, we know that the mass flow rate of a compressor with clearance is given by this expression where uh, this is the clearance volumetric efficiency. V dot SW is the swept uh, uh, volume rate of the compressor which is fixed and V is the specific volume at the inlet to the compressor. So, as you are increasing the evaporator temperature two things uh, take place first is uh, the volumetric efficiency increases as shown here and this specific volume V reduces. Okay. So, you can see that uh, in the numerator is increasing and denominator is reducing as a result mass flow rate of the refrigerant increases very rapidly as the evaporator temperature increases. So, as I have uh, told uh, at a limiting pressure ratio or at a limiting evaporator temperature the volumetric efficiency becomes 0 okay. and the mass flow rate as I have already explained is, a, is equal to the product of volumetric uh, efficiency into swept volume rate divided by the specific volume and the mass flow rate increases with evaporator temperature due to increase in volumetric efficiency and decrease in specific volume of refrigerant at compressor inlet. This is very clear from the uh, figure. Now, let us look at the effect of evaporator temperature on refrigeration effect and refrigeration capacity. When I say the effect of uh, evaporator temperature on the refrigeration capacity of a compressor, what exactly we mean? Uh, a compressor cannot provide a refrigeration capacity. Okay. So, what we mean by refrigeration capacity of a compressor means uh, the, it is the refrigeration capacity of a system which uses this particular compressor. That means, we are talking about the performance of a system which uses this uh, compressor. Okay. Uh, so, let us see the effect of uh, the temperature on the refrigeration effect and capacity. Refrigeration effect increases marginally with evaporated temperature, this will be clear from the pH diagram. Okay. And refrigeration capacity increases rapidly with evaporated temperature because both mass flow rate and refrigeration effect increase with evaporated temperature. Okay. So, let us look at the figure. You can see here that at this uh, evaporated temperature or evaporator pressure, this is the refrigeration effect. Okay. And as the evaporator temperature has increased, the refrigeration effect increased by this much amount and further increase has uh, raised the refrigeration effect by this much amount. Okay. So, the refrigeration effect as given by Q H 1 minus H 3 increases as uh, T e increases. This is because of the shape of the P H diagram. And the same thing is shown in this figure also as evaporator temperature is increasing the refrigeration effect here is increasing. Of course, this increase is not very rapid because this depends upon the slope of the saturation vapor curve on pH diagram. Okay. So, this uh, increase is not very rapid, but uh, the increase in refrigeration capacity is very rapid. Why is it so? Because you can see that the refrigeration capacity is nothing but the product of mass flow rate into refrigeration effect. So, as the temperature of evaporator is increasing both the mass flow rate as well as refrigeration effect both increase. Since both of them are increasing and the mass flow rate increases very rapidly, the refrigeration capacity increases very rapidly with evaporator temperature. Now, let us look at the effect of evaporator temperature on work of compression and power requirement. Work of compression decreases as evaporator temperature increases. This will be again clear from the pH chart and power input varies from 0 at a limiting evaporator temperature at which the clearance volumetric efficiency becomes 0, then it reaches a peak and again it becomes 0 when the evaporator temperature equals condenser temperature. At this point the work of compression becomes 0. Okay. So, finally, the power input is a product of mass flow rate into delta H c. So, when the evaporator temperature is very low, mass flow rate becomes very low and when the evaporator temperature is high. Uh, work of compression becomes uh, low. So, as a result uh, you have a peak. Okay. So, this is clear from this figure. So, here the work of compression delta H c is H 2 minus H 1. So, when the evaporator temperature is low this is a work of compression. Okay. So, as the evaporator temperature increased in this direction the work of compression is reduced. For example, uh, for this, uh, this thing this is the work of compression. And for this evaporator uh, temperature, this is the work of compression. So, delta H c as you can see is reducing as T e is increasing. So, the same thing is shown in this figure. You can see that um, 
or cuff compression is reducing as the evaporator temperature is increasing. Okay, and at a limiting value, when uh, the evaporator temperature uh, becomes equal to the condenser temperature, the work of compression becomes zero. Okay, so this is the zero. It becomes zero. So at at one side. Now let us look at the effect of evaporator temperature as I have already told on the power input of the compressor. The power input of the compressor is given by mass flow rate into work of compression and as we have seen as evaporator temperature increases work of compression is reducing. Okay. And we have also, also seen that as evaporator temperature increases mass flow rate increases. Okay. So at a very low evaporator temperature that means at a lower limit at this point the power input is 0 because mass flow rate is equal to 0. Why the mass flow rate is equal to 0? The mass flow rate is equal to 0 because the clearance volumetric efficiency is 0. Okay. So, at this point mass flow rate is 0. Since mass flow rate is 0, obviously the power input is 0 because power input is a product of mass flow rate into work of compression. Okay. So, you can see that that is also 0. And uh, on the other end, when the evaporator temperature becomes equal to the condenser temperature, work of compression is equal to 0. Again, power is equal to 0. Okay, that means the power curve um, uh, starts from 0, reaches a peak and again becomes 0. Okay, so, this is a very important uh, characteristic and we have to pay little attention to this. I okay, uh, will come to this in the next slide. Variation of power input with evaporator temperature is very important in practice. If the design evaporator temperature lies to the left of the peak and compressor motor is designed for this uh, design point, then a motor gets overloaded during every pull down period. So, what is the meaning of this? So, as you know this is the uh, temperature at which the power becomes peak. Let us say that uh, we are operating the system at this point, that means this is our design evaporator temperature. Okay. So, at this design evaporator temperature, what is the required power input? Required power input is this. Okay. So, this is the required power input. Suppose, you have selected a compressor motor uh, for this uh, design power input. Okay. It will work uh, all right as long as the evaporator temperature is at this point, but during pull down, what happens? First of all, what do we mean by pull down? So, whenever uh, a refrigeration system is started, initially the refrigeration uh, system temperature will be same as that of the ambient. That means, everything will be at, the, at, at an equilibrium condition and the temperature of all the parts, all the components of the system will be same as the ambient temperature. So, when you start the refrigeration system for the first time, the evaporator will be at ambient temperature, condenser will be at ambient temperature. Okay. So, as the system starts running, uh, refrigeration uh, effect uh, starts increasing. And uh, as a result, uh, the temperature of the system uh, of the evaporator starts decreasing. Okay. So, initially the evaporator temperature is same as ambient temperature, but with time the evaporator temperature reduces. Okay. This uh, process uh, continues till the required evaporator temperature is achieved in the uh, refrigerant system. Once the required evaporator temperature is achieved or once the required refrigeration space temperature is achieved, some control action will take place and the required temperatures will be maintained. That means, during every pull down, uh, the evaporator temperature starts with a high temperature, may be equal to the ambient temperature, and then it uh, uh, decreases and reaches the design point. Okay, so this is known as pull down uh, time, and uh, this is the pull down process. Okay, now if you look at uh, this power curve, uh, let us say that uh, at the beginning of the pull down, the evaporator temperature is somewhere here. Okay, that means same as the condenser temperature, which is equal to ambient temperature. So when the system is started. Uh, it uh, the evaporator temperature starts decreasing in this direction. When the evaporator temperature starts decreasing in this direction, the power curve proceeds in this direction. Initially, the power requirement is zero because the work of compression is zero. Okay, even though the mass flow rate is quite high. Okay, so because the work of compression is zero, this is zero. So the power input increases like this, and when it reaches at this point, the power uh, requirement at this point is same as the uh, motor power uh, rating okay because you have designed the motor for the design uh, evaporator temperature okay but uh, the evaporator temperature has to decrease further when the evaporator temperature has to decrease further the power has to proceed along this line okay along this line and it has to reach a peak and then it has to decrease and then it has to come to the design point okay this happens during every pull down that means every pull down, during every pull down between uh, these two temperatures Okay, the motor gets overloaded. Okay, and this is the amount of uh, extra power required 
uh, over and above the design uh, power of the motor to bring the system from the initial temperature to the design temperature. Okay. If this happens during uh, every pull down, then uh, the motor will be continuously overloaded during every pull down and this may affect the life of the motor. Okay. So, this is a very important problem. So, what is the solution for this? One uh, um, easy solution is to design a motor for peak power. Okay. Of course, this is not an efficient solution because uh, most of the time the system has to operate at the design point. So, when the uh, system is operating at the design point, the design power input will be much less than the peak power input. That means, the compressor motor will be underutilized most of the time. Okay. So, this is not a very good solution. So, what other solutions are possible? One solution, one uh, practical uh, solution is to throttle the suction side during pull down so that the actual mass flow rate is lower during the pull down and motor does not pass through the power peak. Okay, so, what is the meaning of this? So, as you said this is the let us say this is your design point and this is the design power okay, of the motor W design. So, as soon as uh, you start the refrigerant system that means, as soon as the pull down uh, process starts the po power requirement starts increasing in this direction. So, during this process what is done is uh, there will be a valve at the inlet to the compressor let us say that this is the compressor okay. and this valve is uh, closed during the pull down. So, when this valve is closed there will be a large pressure drop across this valve okay. that means, you are basically throttling the refrigerant vapor. So, when you are introducing artificially a pressure drop across this the evaporator pressure will be much la larger than the suction pressure as a result the mass flow rate of refrigerant reduces. Okay. Once the mass flow rate reduces we know that power input is equal to mass flow rate into delta H c. Okay. So, even though the delta H c is increasing since you are reducing the mass flow rate by throttling the power does not increase. Okay. This is increasing and mass flow rate is reducing. So, as a result instead of going through this um, uh, power peak uh, the process will take place like this. Okay. So, that means, you are skipping the peak. right? So, the required power input will be maintained at the design power input. So, as soon as uh, this reaches this point, this valve is fully open and this delta P becomes 0. So, the system will uh, work normally. Okay. So, this is one of the practical uh, solutions to the uh, power peak problem. And of course, it is also possible in multi cylinder compressors to unload some of the cylinders during pull down uh, process. When you are unloading some of the cylinders, the total uh, mass flow rate gets reduced. Okay. So, uh, since the total mass flow rate gets reduced, the power uh, requirement also reduces. So, as soon as uh, it reaches the design power uh, design point, then uh, all the cylinders will be uh, loaded, otherwise, uh, some of the cylinders will be unloaded. So, these are two practical solutions to take care of the uh, power peak during pull down. Now, let us look at the effect of uh, evaporator temperature on COP and volume flow rate per unit capacity. We know that COP is defined as a refrigeration capacity divided by the power input of the compressor that is QE divided by WC. Okay. So, this can be written in terms of the refrigeration effect and work of compression that means, ultimately COP is equal to QE divided by delta H c where QE is the refrigeration effect and delta H c is the work of compression. And we have seen that uh, as evaporator temperature increases, refrigeration effect increases that means, this increases and uh, delta H c reduces. Okay. Since, uh, refrigeration effect increases and delta H c reduces obviously, C O P increases with evaporator temperature. I okay. will show you the figure uh, now. And uh, the next uh, parameter is volume flow rate uh, per unit capacity. The volume flow rate per unit capacity is defined like this. So, this can be written as specific volume divided by the refrigeration effect. So, as evaporator temperature increases, specific volume reduces and refrigeration effect increases. So, as a result, the volume flow rate per unit capacity reduces as evaporator temperature increases. Okay. So, let me show this. Okay. So, that is what is shown here. Uh, this is the COP curve. So, as I have already explained, as evaporator temperature is increasing, refrigeration effect increases and work of compression reduces. So, you can see that COP increases quite rapidly as evaporator temperature is increasing. This is a good thing and uh, you get higher COP at higher evaporator temperatures. Of course, this is in line with your uh, uh, performance of a reverse Carnot cycle. And uh, the second parameter is your volume flow rate per unit capacity that is in the meter cube per kilowatt per second. 
So, again as I have already explained this is uh, equal to the ratio of specific volume uh, V e at compressor inlet divided by the refrigeration effect. So, V e reduces as T increases and refrigeration effect increases as T increases. As a result this uh, volume require volume flow rate per unit capacity reduces steeply with evaporator temperature. That means, what is the practical uh, significance of this parameter? As you can see this is defined as the meter cube per kilowatt per second. That means, for a given capacity, given refrigeration capacity that means, given Q e uh, the size of the compressor reduces as uh, V reduces. Okay. That means, if you are operating the system at uh, higher evaporated temperature, uh, the required size of the compressor reduces. Okay. So, that is the practical significance. Now, let us look at the effect of uh, condensing temperature. So, in most of the refrigerant systems, atmospheric air is used as a heat sink and as we know the atmospheric temperature uh, does not remain constant. It, in fact, it can vary over a wide range. That means, the heat rejection temperature varies over, over a wide range depending upon the variation in the ambient temperature. That means, the condensing temperature also varies. Okay. So, variation in condensing temperature obviously affects the performance of the compressor and also the refrigerant system. So, we need to study what is the effect of this on system performance. So, this is done uh, by keeping uh, clearance ratio and evaporator temperature fixed. That means, for uh, studying the effect of the evaporator temperature, what we have done is we have kept the clearance ratio and condensing temperature fixed and then we varied the evaporator temperature. Okay. So, to study the effect of the condensing temperature, we keep the evaporator temperature fixed and clearance ratio fixed and then vary the condensing temperature and find out what is its effect on uh, mass flow rate, volumetric efficiency and other performance parameters. Okay. So, first let us look at the effect of uh, condensing temperature on volumetric efficiency and mass flow rate. At a fixed evaporator temperature, as condensing temperature increases, the pressure ratio increases. Okay. So, P e is fixed. So, P c by, P c by P e increases as P c is increasing. Okay. As a result, the clearance volumetric efficiency and mass flow rate decrease. However, the effect is not as severe as in the case of evaporator temperature since the specific volume at the compressor inlet does not vary with condensing temperature. Okay. That means, uh, higher condensing temperature affects the performance, but not as adversely as uh, a low evaporator temperature affects the performance. Okay. So, let me show this on the figure. So, as uh, you know the volumetric efficiency, clearance volumetric efficiency uh, reduces as uh, P c by P e increases. Okay. So, we are fixing P e that means, so this uh, reduces as P c increases. Okay. So, that is what is shown here uh, volumetric efficiency is reducing as condensing temperature is increasing for a fixed evaporator temperature. Okay. And then the mass flow rate as you know is defined as the product of uh, clearance volumetric efficiency, displacement rate of the compressor and specific volume at the inlet to the compressor. So, as you are increasing the condensing temperature this is reducing. Okay. This is fixed because we are assuming that the compressor is fixed. So, clearance volumetric efficiency is reducing. How about uh, the specific volume at the inlet to the compressor? This does not remain, this, this does not vary because condensing temperature has no effect on this as long as you are keeping the evaporator temperature constant. Okay. That means, this is uh, fixed and this is uh, reducing as T c is increasing. As a result, the mass flow rate reduces with condensing temperature. Okay. But as you can see that uh, the effect for a given delta T is not as severe as in, uh, in the case of evaporator because in the in case of evaporator when you are reducing the evaporator temperature this is increasing okay, and this is reducing. So, you both uh, numerator is reducing and denominator is increasing. So, the effect on mass flow rate is much severe whereas here only the numerator uh, reduces whereas the denominator remains constant. Now, let us look at the effect of uh, condensing temperature on refrigeration effect and refrigeration capacity. Refrigeration effect decreases marginally as the enthalpy at the inlet to evaporator increases with condensing temperature. I will show you this on PS diagram. 
and refrigeration capacity decreases with condensing temperature because both mass flow rate as well as refrigeration effect decrease with uh, condensing temperature. Okay, so as I uh, explained, so for a uh, let us say that for this uh, for this condensing temperature, let us say T C 1, okay, so this is the refrigeration effect, right. Uh, and uh, for uh, this condensing temperature, as you are increasing the condenser temperature, the refrigeration effect is uh, this. And if you increase it further, the refrigeration effect becomes this. Okay, so as you can see, refrigeration effect QE is reducing as TC is increasing. This point is fixed. This is happening because the enth enthalpy at the inlet to the evaporator is uh, increasing as you are increasing the pressure or the temperature. Okay. So as a result of which, your refrigeration effect, as uh, seen here, reduces with condensing temperature. Now, what is the effect of the condensing temperature on refrigeration capacity? Refrigeration capacity is nothing but the product of mass flow rate into refrigeration effect and we know that mass flow rate reduces as uh, just now we have seen condensing temperature increases and uh, here it is shown that QE also reduces as TC increases. Okay. So, both mass flow rate is also reducing and the refrigeration effect is also reducing as condensing temperature is increased. So, the refrigeration capacity reduces with condensing temperature. Now, let us look at the effect of condensing temperature on uh, work of compression and power input. Work of compression increases with uh, condensing temperature as the enthalpy at the exit of compressor increases. And power input varies from 0 at T is equal to T C. As we have seen earlier, when evaporator temperature is same as condenser temperature, the work of compression becomes 0. Okay. As a result, the power input will be 0. And then it reaches a peak as condenser temperature increases further and again decreases as the mass flow rate decreases. Okay. That means, this uh, performance uh, uh, shape of the curve will be almost similar to that of evaporator. Uh, However, peak power is not as serious as in evaporator temperature variation since the chances of condenser operating at such high condensing temperatures are very rare. Okay. So, let me explain this with the help of uh, the pH and pH chart. As you can see when the condensing temperature is uh, T C 1, this is the work of compression. As the condenser temperature becomes T C 2, this is your work of compression and this is the work of compression for T C 3. Okay, this is T C 3 and this is T C 2. So, as you can see that the work of compression increases as condenser temperature increases. So, that is what is shown in this figure. The work of compression is increasing as condenser temperature is increasing and as I have already uh, explained the power input W c is the product of mass flow rate of refrigerant into work of compression and work of compression is increasing monotonically that means, delta H c increases as T c increases. However, mass flow rate reduces as T c increases. Why does it reduce? Because your volumetric efficiency reduces as T C increases. Okay. So, you have to, uh, opposing effects uh, here, uh, mass flow rate is reducing and work of compression is increasing and at the limiting value when uh, T E is equal to T C or T C is equal to T E, uh, at this point work of compression is equal to 0. Okay. So, the power input is 0 and this uh, power input increases because the work of compression is increasing. It reaches a peak and then again it starts decreasing. It starts decreasing because from this point onwards the effect of condensing temperature on mass flow rate is much much higher than its effect on the work of compression. Okay. So, this reduction takes place because mass flow rate reduces as condensing temperature increases. Okay. So, you can see that here also we have a peak just like uh, uh, the power peak with uh, evaporator temperature. However, this problem is not very serious because this peak occurs normally at very high uh, condenser temperatures. Okay. Most of the times we will be operating the condenser 
uh, in, on this side only that means to the left of the peak. So, the chances of uh, compressor power reaching a peak due to variation in condensing temperature is not very uh, uh, I mean it is uh, remote. That is what is mentioned here the peak power is okay uh, effect of condensing temperature or peak power is not uh, very serious. Now, let us look at the effect of condensing temperature on COP and volume flow rate per unit capacity. So, you can easily uh, uh, state this that the COP decreases with increase in condensing temperature because COP is a ratio of refrigeration effect and work of compression. So, when you are increasing the condensing temperature refrigeration effect reduces and work of compression increases that means the numerator reduces and denominator increases. So, obviously COP will uh, decrease. Okay. And what is the effect of this on volume flow rate? Uh, the volume flow rate uh, per unit capacity increases because as you are increasing the condensing temperature, the specific uh, the refrigeration effect decreases even though the specific volume remains constant. Okay. So, as a result the volume flow rate uh, per unit capacity increases. So, let me show this uh, the figure. As we have seen uh, for the in case of COP, this is reducing as you are increasing the condensing temperature, then you can see that initially it was this, then it reduced to this much, then it reduced to this much. Okay. That means, the numerator is continuously reducing the refrigeration effect and the denominator as you have seen is increasing okay, from this point and then finally, it has increased gone up to this value. Okay. So, as a result the COP reduces, that is what is shown here the COP okay, it is reducing as condensing temperature is increasing. And again as I have explained uh, what is the effect of condensing temperature on uh, the volume of flow rate per unit capacity that is uh, nothing but the ratio of specific volume at compressor inlet and the refrigeration effect. Okay, so, this remains uh, constant at uh, fixed TE. So, the numerator does not vary, but as you are increasing the condensing temperature the denominator is reducing as a result the volume flow rate also increases. That means, uh, the required size of the compressor increases if you keep the uh, capacity constant. So, from these above results that means, from the effects of evaporator and condenser temperature on the system performance using this compressor, we can conclude that performance of the system degrades as evaporator temperature decreases and condensing temperature increases. That means, as temperature lift increases. Again, this is in line with the effect of uh, these temperatures on Kano refrigeration system. Okay. This should be obvious because the vapor compression system is developed uh, from the Kano reference system only. Okay. This is a deviation, there are some deviations from Kano cycle, but it has to obey the basic uh, uh, principles okay. in Kano cycle also as you increase the evaporator temperature COP increases as you reduce the condensing temperature COP imp uh, increases. Okay. Same thing is observed here also and uh, as we have seen here when the temperature lift becomes very high uh, the performance may, may become very poor. Okay. In such cases we may have to go for multi stage compression as we have discussed in our earlier lectures and it is also seen that compared to condensing temperature the effect of evaporator temperature is more significant. Now, let us look at the another important uh, performance parameter that is the discharge temperature. Okay, what is the problem if the discharge temperature is high? If the compressor discharge temperature is very high then the lubricating oil may break down resulting in excessive wear and uh, reduce life of valves mainly the discharge valves and ultimately the life of compressor also uh, reduces uh, when the discharge temperature is very high. And uh, because of high discharge temperatures undesired chemical reactions may take place especially in the presence of moisture. So, why should uh, there be moisture in the refrigerant system? Uh, when you charge any refrigerant system initially there will be air inside the system, okay. uh, complete system will be filled with air. So, normally you have to evacuate the system thoroughly, so that uh, there is no air left inside the system and then charge the system with refrigerant, but it is not possible to perfectly evacuate any refrigerant system. Okay. So, there will be some uh, pressure inside that means, there will be some air and if that air consists of some moisture, there will be some moisture within the system. In addition to that if there is any leakage, then outside air may enter into the system. 
So, there is a possibility that uh, moisture is present inside the refrigeration system, okay, any refrigeration system. Uh, so, when there is a moisture present inside the refrigeration system, then there will be uh, uh, undesired uh, chemical reaction between the refrigerant, lubricating oil and moisture when the discharge temperature is very high. Okay. So, this will ultimately affect the life of the compressor. Okay. So, this is uh, one uh, bad effect of high discharge temperature. And in hermetic compressors, the insulation on motor winding may burn leading to short circuiting and compressor damage. We have seen in the last class that in hermetic uh, compressors, the motor has to be cooled using the suction gas itself, okay, because the motor and uh, compressor both are kept in the same uh, shell. Okay. So, if the discharge temperature is very high, the whole of the compressor uh, becomes hot. Okay. As a result, the motor winding temperature also goes up. Okay. If the motor winding temperature becomes very high, then the insulation on the winding may burn. Once the insulation burns, uh, the wires uh, get short circuited. Once short circuiting takes place, uh, the motor burns. Okay, so, this is a typical problem in uh, hermetic compressors. So, because of these uh, problems, normally we should not operate any uh, compressor uh, beyond a certain discharge temperature. Okay, that means, uh, you have to operate it at as low a discharge temperature as possible. Okay. Now, let us see how the uh, uh, discharge temperature is decided or uh, what affects the discharge temperature. So, if you assume the compression process uh, to be isentropic and if you also assume that the refrigerant vapor to behave as an ideal gas, then we can write these equations. If the compression process is isentropic, then we can write this equa equation where P is the pressure and V is the specific volume and uh, gamma as you know is the ratio of specific heats. Okay. And for an isentropic pro process, P V to the power of gamma is constant. And if the refrigerant va vapor behaves as an ideal gas, then we can write for the vapor P V is equal to R T where R is the gas constant and T is the absolute temperature. So, from these two equations, we can uh, derive this equation for the discharge temperature of the compressor. Okay. That means, the discharge temperature at the exit of the compressor T d is equal to T e into P c by P e to the power of gamma minus 1 by gamma. Okay. This is uh, using these two equations. Okay. So, from this equation, you can very easily say that as uh, uh, P c by P e increases, discharge temperature increases. Okay. Similarly, as gamma increases, discharge temperature increases. Let me show this on a figure. Okay. So, this is the expression for uh, discharge temperature and here we are varying the pressure ratio. You are varying the pressure ratio means either you can increase the condenser pressure or you can reduce the evaporator pressure. Okay. So, both will result in higher pressure ratio and the discharge temperature is shown on the y axis. And uh, the discharge temperatures uh, are shown for three different refrigerants, ammonia, R 22 and R 12. Okay. First thing you can notice here is that as the pressure ratio is increasing, that means as the pressure ratio R p increases, discharge temperature increases for a given refrigerant. That is obvious from this equation. Okay. And uh, at a given compression ratio, discharge temperature of nitrogen, I mean of ammonia sorry, of ammonia is higher than discharge temperature with R 22, which is higher than the discharge temperature of R 12. Okay. Why does it uh, happen? This happens because gamma of nitrogen, I mean gamma of uh, ammonia again sorry, is greater than gamma of R 22, which is again greater than gamma of R 12. Okay. That means, since ammonia has high uh, isentropic index of compression, the discharge for the same pressure ratio, the discharge temperatures of ammonia will be very, very high in fact. Okay. Uh, so this is the reason why ammonia compressors require some external cooling. Okay. So, thus, thus for refrigerants with high values of uh, specific heat ratio and operating at high pressure ratios, the discharge temperature can be very high. This implies that there is a need for external cooling to keep the discharge temperature within safe limits. That means, uh, we can use for example, uh, external water jackets in case of ammonia compressor. So, this is a very common practice. Uh, if you look at any ammonia compressor, there will be external water jacket welded to the outer uh, body of the compressor and water will be circulating through these water jackets and uh, this water extracts the heat from the uh, body of the compressor. So, that the discharge temperature can be kept low. So far, we have been discussing uh, the performance uh, of 
uh, ideal reciprocating compressor. Uh, first we discussed uh, without clearance and then we discussed the performance with clearance, okay. Still the compressor is ideal, okay, because uh, we consider the processes to be reversible. We know very well that in actual case none of the processes are reversible, okay. That means the actual compressor deviates from ideal compressor, okay. So if that is the case, how does an actual compressor behave? What is the effect of uh, these operating temperature? So, on the performance of an actual compressor, okay. First let us look at the differences between an actual compressor and an ideal compressor, okay. Actual compression process deviates from ideal compression processes due to three effects. The first effect is heat transfer between refrigerant and surroundings during suction, compression and expansion strokes, okay. In the ideal compressor we uh, neglected heat transfer, we assumed that all the processes were uh, adiabatic, whereas in actual case they are non-adiabatic. And the second effect or second difference, there will be frictional pressure drops in actual compressors which were neglected in case of ideal compressors. And what is the reason for this pre frictional pressure drops? The, pre the, the frictional pressure drops in connecting lines uh, across suction and discharge valves, all these are because of resistance to fluid flow, okay. And the third effect which we have now neglected is leakage losses, okay. So these are the three differences between an ideal compressor and an actual compressor. First let us look at the effect of heat transfer, what happens uh, because of the heat transfer. Uh, heat transfer takes place from cylinder walls and piston to the refrigerant during suction stroke and from refrigerant to surroundings towards the end of compression. What does it mean? When the refrigerant enters into the compressor, the refrigerant is coming from the evaporator. That means it enters into the compressor at low pressure and low temperature, okay. And uh, during the initial uh, phase of the suction process, the refrigerant temperature will be lower than the uh, surrounding temperature. Surrounding temperature means surrounding body temperature, okay. The body will be hotter than the refrigerant. That means there will be heat transfer from the surroundings to the refrigerant. Uh, surroundings means the piston and the cylinder walls, etc. Okay, that means the refrigerant vapor gets heated up during the suction process. And at the end of compression, we find that the refrigerant vapor temperature increases uh, rapidly. Okay, so at the end of compression, you find that the refrigerant temperature is higher than the surrounding temperature. That means the refrigerant uh, rejects heat to the surroundings. That means during the beginning of uh, suction, the heat transfer is from the surroundings to the refrigerant, and at the end of compression, heat transfer will be from the refrigerant to the surroundings, okay. And in hermetic compressors as we know additional heat transfer takes place between motor and refrigerant. Due to these heat transfer first, especially during the suction process, the temperature of refrigerant at compressor inlet increases, okay. So what is the problem if the refrigerant at the compressor inlet becomes hotter? The problem is that it increases the specific volume of the vapor and reduces the refrigerant mass flow rate. Once the refrigerant mass flow rate is reduced, the refrigerant capacity reduces, okay. That means higher the inlet uh, temperature, uh, smaller will be the density, okay. That means for the same uh, compressor displacement rate, less mass of refrigerant will be pumped, okay. The mass flow rate will become less. Once the mass flow rate uh, reduces, as we know that refrigerant capacity of the system reduces, okay. So this is a very important uh, parameter. And uh, what is the extent of reduction? The extent of reduction in refrigeration uh, in refrigeration capacity due to the heating depends on pressure ratio, compressor speed and compressor design. And the uh, suction temperature increases as the uh, pressure ratio increases. Why does the suction temperature increases as the pressure ratio increases? We know that the, as the pressure ratio increases, the discharge temperature increases. Once the discharge temperature increases, the whole uh, compressor body temperature increases. Once the uh, compressor body becomes warmer, uh, then obviously there will be higher heat transfer from the compressor body to the cold suction gas. As a result, uh, the suction temperature at the beginning of the comp uh, compression increases, okay. Then, the suction temperature also increases as compressor speed increases. Why the suction temperature should increase when compressor speed increases? When the compressor speed increases, more heat is generated within less time and less time is available for heat rejection. As a result, uh, energy gets trapped and the body becomes hotter. Once the body of the compressor becomes hotter, there will be higher heat transfer from the body to the refrigerant vapor and the, as a result, its uh, temperature increases, okay. 
and of course uh, temperature also depends upon the type of external cooling provided that means uh, uh, how the compressor uh, body is cooled as we have seen if the discharge temperature is likely to become very high you have to provide external cooling okay by way of uh, water jackets or by way of uh, external force convection using a fan or something like that okay so what kind of uh, external cooling that you are providing decides uh, what is the uh, temperature of the body of the compressor and this in turn depends uh, decides the suction temperature okay in refrigerant such as r12 where the discharge temperature is low normally no uh, external cooling is provided by means of force circulation of air or water jackets okay natural circulation is enough but as the refrigerant changes from uh, r12 to let us say ammonia the discharge temperature becomes very high okay so we need the external cooling so once you provide external cooling the temperature of the body reduces once the temperature of the body reduces the suction temperature also reduces so finally the suction temperature depends upon these uh, three parameters that means the compressor speed pressure ratio and the type of cooling provided okay and uh, due to heat transfer compression and re expansion processes are not adiabatic and depending upon the type of compressor and external cooling the compression process may approach adiabatic process in case of centrifugal compressors centrifugal compressors as we know run at very high speed okay and they are quite compact for large capacities so since they are well compact and they run at very high speeds very less time is available for heat transfer to take place from the compressor to the surroundings or from the refrigerant to the surroundings okay that means uh, the centrifugal compressors compression process in centrifugal compressor almost approaches adiabatic compression process uh, because of very less heat transfer okay and uh, if it is a reciprocating compressor uh, with uh, cylinder cooling then the compression process may approach poly reversible polytropic process we know that the polytropic process is general term uh it is a process with heat transfer okay and when you have a reciprocating compressor normally the speed at which reciprocating compressors operate is less than the speed of centrifugal compressors okay on top of it if you provide uh, external cooling then uh, there is a possibility of uh, um, sufficient heat transfer from the cylinder uh, from the compressor to the surroundings okay that means uh, the process will approach a polytropic process okay that means uh, for reciprocating compressors one can use an assumption of reversible polytropic process and for centrifugal compressors one has to use an one can use an adiabatic uh, process okay for calculations and the index of compression in actual compressors depends on the process and is not a property of refrigerant if the ref compression process is uh, reversible and uh, adiabatic that means if the compression process is isentropic we know that the index of compression k or gamma if it is behaving as an ideal gas is a property of the refrigerant okay so uh, it is decided by the uh, type of the refrigerant okay for a given operating conditions but uh, if the process is polytropic then the index of compression that is the polytropic index of compression is no longer a property of the refrigerant it becomes a property of the process that means how you are cooling it as i said if you have a compression process uh, with a good amount of cooling then the index of compression uh, could be lower than the isentropic index of compression that means uh, the index of compression of a reversible polytropic process will be lower than uh the index of compression of an adi adiabatic process uh, on the other hand if the process is highly irreversible and uh, the process is adiabatic uh, then the index of compression will be higher than the uh, reversible adiabatic index of compression okay so ultimately the index of compression is uh, what depends upon the type of process okay since the actual compression process is irreversible the actual work input uh, Uh, will be greater than isentropic work okay in all compressors and in all compression processes uh, the actual compression will never be uh, uh, reversible adiabatic okay it will always be irreversible due to heat transfer due to pressure drops etc okay so the actual work input will always be greater than the uh, reversible adiabatic work input and uh, we define an isentropic efficiency to estimate the actual work input and this isentropic efficiency is defined as the ratio of isentropic work of compression divided by actual work of compression okay in this expression this is the isentropic work of compression and this is actual work of compression 
for a given compressor isentropic, isentropic efficiency is mainly a function of pressure ratio. So, it is observed that uh, from uh, several um, tests on compressors that the isentropic efficiency for a given compressor depends mainly on the pressure ratio. Okay. Uh, once the pressure ratio is fixed it is observed that the isentropic efficiency is more or less fixed. Okay. And normally empirical equations are developed from measured test data to estimate isentropic efficiency. Okay. So, normally the ma manufacturers of the compressors they supply this information, they give the uh, expressions for isentropic efficiency as a function of uh, pressure ratio. Okay. So, depending upon your pressure ratio you can calculate what is the isentropic of efficiency of the that particular compressor. So, what is the use of this? Because you have to use this isentropic efficiency to estimate the actual uh, power input to the compressor because you cannot uh, calculate actual power input uh, theoretically. Theoretically what you can do is you can calculate what is the isentropic work of compression if you know the operating temperatures and operating conditions. Okay. So, the procedure for calculating the actual power input is like this, first uh, from the operating temperatures calculate what is the isentropic work of compression. Then from the expression for isentropic efficiency find out isentropic efficiency and then uh, the actual power input is equal to isentropic power input divided by the isentropic efficiency. Okay. This is what is done normally to estimate the actual power input to the compressor. Now, let us look at the effect of pressure drops. As I have already mentioned in actual compressors pressure drops occur due to resistance to fluid flow. Here fluid means refrigerant. Okay. So, whenever a refrigerant is flowing through a connecting pipelines or across the valves and all there will be some resistance because of this resistance there will be pressure drop. And pressure drop across suction valve is called as wire drawing. Okay. This is a very impor important parameter. Uh, why is it important? Uh, suction side pressure drop affects the system performance significantly because as this pressure drop increases uh, the volumetric efficiency is reduced and it also increases the work of compression and discharge temperature. So, in uh, practical uh, cases the suction side pressure drop is very very important. And discharge side pressure drop is also important, but it is not as important as a uh, suction side pressure drop. Let me show the PV diagram with uh, pressure drops. So, this, uh, this is the PV diagram with with uh, pressure drops. So, you can see that uh, had there been no pressure drop uh, this would have been the compression process. Okay. Let us say that uh, this I am writing 0 0.1, 2, 3, 4. So, 1, 2, 3, 4 is the PV diagram without any pressure drop, okay, without delta P. But uh, with pressure drop the cycle becomes uh, 1 dash, let us say 2 dash, 3. 4 dash. Okay, the cycle becomes 1 dash, 2 dash, 3, 4 dash. Okay. So, what is the effect of pressure drop on the volumetric efficiency? You can see that the effect of uh, pressure drop on volumetric efficiency is to reduce the volume of refrigerant compressed. What is the volume of refrigerant compressed at this evaporator pressure because of pressure drop? It is equal to this. Okay. And uh, what is the actual volumetric displacement rate? What is the actual volumetric displacement rate is this. Okay, so, you can see that because of the pressure drop uh, this has reduced okay. and because of the pressure drop the area of the PV diagram has also increased and that increase is equal to this hatched area. Okay. These hatched areas are because of the uh, pressure drops. So, as a result of uh, pressure drop on the suction side and on the discharge side you can see that uh, work of compression also has increased okay, and that increase is equal to the hatched area and ultimately this is the pressure at which the compression is taking place. Okay. So, at the inlet to the compression process the pressure is P s and P s is less than P e. Okay. And similarly this is the discharge pressure and discharge pressure P d is greater than P c. That means, P, um, that means P d divided by P s is greater than P c divided by P e. Okay. So, as a result your volumetric efficiency 
reduces. Once the volumetric efficiency reduces, mass flow rate reduces, refrigeration capacity reduces. In addition to that, the work of uh, work input uh, is increasing. So, ultimately the FUOP of the system gets affected. Now, let us look at the effect of leakage losses. In actual compressors, refrigerant leakage losses occur across cylinder valves and piston, across suction and discharge valves, across oil fill in open type compressors. We did not consider this leakage while discussing ideal compressors, but in actual compressor there will be leakages. And the magnitude of these losses depends on pressure ratio, design of compressor valves and life and condition of the compressor. If the con uh, compressor is old, then the leakage losses will be high. Okay? Uh, and if the pressure ratio is high, the leakage losses will be more and if the valves are not designed properly, then again there will be higher leakage losses. And leakage losses increase as I have already mentioned uh, with pressure ratio and uh, leakage losses increase as the compressor speed is decreased and uh, the leakage losses also increase with compressor life. So, due to these leakages, some amount of refrigerant vapor flows through the suction valves at the beginning of compression stroke and some amount of refrigerant enters into the compression uh, compressor through the discharge valves during the suction. Okay. So, some uh, that means some uh, refrigerant uh, escapes out of the suction valve uh, at the beginning of the compression stroke. Uh, similarly, at the uh, beginning of the suction stroke, some refrigerant from the condenser enters into the uh, compressor. That means, there will be some backflow. As a result of this, the net mass flow rate uh, reduces. Once the net mass flow rate reduces, the refrigerant capacity reduces. So, as a result of all these deviations, the actual volumetric efficiency of compressors will be lower than clearance volumetric efficiency. And the actual volumetric efficiency can be defined in terms of volumetric flow rates or also in terms of mass flow rates as shown here. So, it is a ratio of actual volumetric flow rate divided by the compressor displacement rate or actual mass flow rate divided by the maximum possible mass flow rate. And in general, the actual volumetric efficiency can be written as uh, there is a this is an expression for actual volumetric efficiency. It is written in terms of theoretical volumetric efficiency, temperature of vapor at suction flange and temperature of vapor at the beginning of compression and leakage losses. So, here as I said here this is the theoretical volumetric efficiency obtained from PV diagram. TSC is the temperature of vapor at suction flange and TSC is the temperature of vapor at the beginning of compression. Okay. Because of uh, cylinder heating and all that, TSC will be greater than TS. Since TSC is greater than TS and uh, this leakage losses will be greater than 0, this will be greater than 0, you will find that actual volumetric efficiency will be less than the theoretical volumetric efficiency. And tests on compressors show that for a given compressor, actual volumetric efficiency is a mainly a function of pressure ratio. That means, if you fix the compressor, the actual volumetric efficiency depends mainly on the pressure ratio only. And uh, from several uh, tests on compressor, uh, it is generally shown that the actual volumetric efficiency can be written as A minus B into R p to the power of C, where R p is the pressure ratio P c by P e and A, B, C are some empirical constants which depend uh, on the type of the compressor and the operating pressure range. Okay. And depending upon the compressor and operating conditions, the difference in theoretical and actual volumetric efficiencies can be anywhere between 4 to 20 percent. Okay. So, uh, if your difference can be as large as 20 percent or it can be as small as 4 percent in a well designed compressor. Okay. So, normally uh, just like isentropic uh, efficiency of the compressor, the manufacturers may supply the expressions for actual volumetric efficiency. Okay. So, from the actual volumetric efficiency, you can uh, find out what is the actual mass flow rate and from that you can find out what is the refrigeration capacity. Okay. That is how you can estimate the performance of actual uh, uh, refrigeration systems. Okay. Uh, with this, I uh, will uh, conclude uh, this lecture. In this lecture, uh, we have discussed the following uh, topics, effect of evaporator and condenser temperature on the performance of an ideal compressor with clearance variation of discharge temperature with operating conditions and deviation between I ideal and actual compressors and finally, uh, performance aspects of actual compressors. Okay. We will continue this in the next lecture. Thank you.